I'm Chris Jesnak. I lead the product marketing team here at a priori. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really excited to get things kicked off here. We, we, we chose this track. We'll give a little bit more of how we chose the different tracks we have here. Um, but first off here, you know, a little bit of background. I've been here about two and a half years. And I joined, uh, you know, my experience before joining a priori, uh, I've been to a couple different manufacturers. Um, one was Spiral International, uh, an engineered faster manufacturer. And then Sensata Technologies, uh, where I actually learned that I overlapped with one of our panelists here, Ramel. Um, so Ramel Gilliland um, is uh, Executive Vice President, Supply Chain and Logistics at Lightning E-Motors. Welcome, Ramel. Um, we are also joined here on stage uh, by Craig Melrose. Welcome, Craig, Executive Vice President, Digital Transformation Solutions at PTC. And John Pilla. Good morning. John is a former uh, engineering executive at Spiro, Spirit Aerosystems. Welcome, John. Thanks. Um, so we'll give each of them a, a moment here to introduce themselves um, and, and go through a little bit more in their background and history with, with a priori. But to kick things off, uh, how I wanted to, to start here is, is give a little bit background on the top priorities in, in manufacturing and, and what we're seeing. And really, this track aligns with the first one that we see here, tackling inflation uh, and margin pressure. There was a survey that one of the, the top major uh, management consultants did uh, in 20, is this year. And when they interviewed the C-suite, there was 72% of, of CEOs that were seeking out cost reduction uh, initiatives, right? It's not surprising. Um, and so that's really what we're going to focus on here. Um, how do we do that? How do we help give new ideas how to think about this and put it in perspective? All right, so there's two other tracks that are happening, but we're going to tie in these concepts throughout the panel here. So the middle here is, is, is mitigating supply chain and manufacturing risk. We'll definitely be, be hitting on that a bit here as well. And then how do you bring carbon and cost together? All right, so we'll be talking about that as well. Now, profit margin. We take a look and, and look at how do we define what profit margin is. It's a relatively simple formula, but it, we all know it's very complicated to deliver on. And when we take a look at this, you know, margin is price minus cost, right? But when we look at the cost side, to do this is very challenging. All of us, we've been involved in cost benchmarking, cost modeling, should costing, cost management, there's so many ways that a lot of us are looking at costs. And, and to really hit our targets can be incredibly challenging. Now, um, we actually have a mic. We want to make this interactive. H how many here had some sort of goal, either for yourself or your department, related to cost in the past year, either now or in the past year, by show of hands? <laughs> OK, let's keep those up. Let's just keep seeing them here. Uh -oh. How many have met? all of your goals that, that you had around cost. Let's keep, keep them up. OK, we've got some in the front. We've actually got a microphone. Olivia, could you? We would love to hear, like, what have you done to, to achieve those goals? Like, tell us maybe something you've done, lesson learned, that might be interesting for the team for us to reflect on. A couple of things uh, we do differently. One thing is the functional analysis. We do the DFV approach, which is design for value approach, which is uh, uh, one one set of that to build the strong pipeline, cost pipeline on that one. The second area which is most important is to do the competitive analysis, gaining the teardowns as well as doing the some of the should costing. And then we started doing the a priori pipeline as well. So we, we do that one as well. So I think uh, those are the couple of areas where we try to build a strong pipeline for the cost and then drive those goals towards the achievement. So that's, that's I think, key one to do that. Excellent. Thanks for sharing. And, and sorry, your name and, and company? Yeah, my name is Umakant Katu, and I'm, a, I'm an engineering director at Door Food Retail. Great. Thanks so much. How about a round of applause? Thanks for sharing. <laughs> So we'd love to hear. We're going to have some Q&A to answer any questions you might have here in a moment. Um, but you know, we're going to go ahead and dive in. Um, now, I'm going to pass it over to the panelists here. And, and we'll start with Ramel. Um, Ramel, I'd love for you to just introduce yourself a bit more, your background, uh, experience with a priori, to kind of give the audience here uh, perspective. OK. Um, I'm Ramel Gilliland. Um, and I've been in supply chain for over 20 years. And I started out my career 
uh, at Ford Motor Company. And I worked for multiple automotive companies, Sensata Technologies included. Um, and when I was at Sensata Technologies, we didn't have a cost estimating group. And we didn't have the concept of new program sourcing. It was, it was kind of disparate in how we managed that and introduced products with cost. So I was tasked with coming up with our new program introduction sourcing process and developing our cost estimating group for Sensata. So that was my first introduction to a priori. Uh, and we were very successful in imp implementing a priori, and that organization is still growing today. Um, my second round with a priori was at GE Appliances. You heard Jill Snyder speak earlier. So when I first came into GE Appliances, I was tasked with identifying the software that we were going to use to build cost estimating. So again, we went, went with a priori, um, and then Jill led that group um, and still leads that group today. So I've done two a priori implementations. Um, a lot of experience around cost management and sourcing. And now at Lightning eMotors, I manage the full supply chain and logistics group. Um, so it's a little bit of a different structure. When we look at a priori, it's more of a design for cost and maybe more of a make versus buy analysis um, for us to use the tool. Great. Thanks, Ramel. Welcome. And Craig, um, want for you to introduce yourself. Afternoon and welcome everyone. Uh, as Chris mentioned, my name is Craig Melrose. I work with PTC and, and think about digital transformation solutions, but also um, the digital thread from the standpoint of engineering, manufacturing, uh, even field service. But for today, we'll talk about manufacturing and, and uh, engineering. Think of me as a 30-year operations transformation, digital transformation person. Uh, as I just mentioned, the last five years have been at PTC embedding the previous 25 years of experience into software to help uh, companies around the globe. Just prior to PTC, I spent over 20 years with McKinsey and Company in their operations practice, uh, was responsible for product development, manufacturing, supply chain, procurement, uh, capital productivity, so all the different functional areas as McKinsey uh, organized it. I also had the opportunity to work with multiple customers in every vertical industry. Um, about half of the Fortune 500, again, all of those problems, operational improvements were around product development, manufacturing, supply chain procurement. Um, so a broad view of the globe, a broad view of, of um, operations, uh, which was extremely valuable to me. The reason McKinsey thought I was uh, decently intelligent to, to try to help all those customers was prior to McKinsey, I spent five years with Toyota North America, where I was responsible for new product introduction for all the North American manufacturing sites in their weld shops. Uh, so I was between product development and manufacturing, taking designs, building equipment, building processes, um, installing those equipment and processes, training the plants on how to operate that equipment to hit cost quality delivery targets, uh, and then supporting plants for launch to full volume. Uh, and again, that was for all of North America. So uh, think of me as kind of a varied uh, career that uh, is literally and figuratively sitting between these two panelists uh, and their careers. Great, thanks Craig. John? Hey, hey, good afternoon. Um, I'm John Pilla. I've spent 42 years in the aerospace and defense business. I started when I was six. <laughs> All right, somebody got it. I, um, I, was, uh, I did a lot of program management work, started as an engineer, um, probably the only person in the, in the world to have been program leader on the composite 787 and the A350 composite airplane in two different times. Uh, I, last few years, I ran a couple different billion dollar businesses within Spirit, and I closed my, uh, I closed my career as the chief technology officer uh, a couple years ago, so now I'm the dreaded consultant. I, um, I spend my time on advisory boards such as the one with um, a priori, which is, which is why I'm really here this week. Great, thanks so much, and welcome, welcome again. So you can see, we, we've really got a wealth of knowledge here um, amongst our three panelists from a broad different age. So let's go ahead and, and really get started here. Um, so we're gonna go into the main panel uh, discussion here. Um, so Ramel, I'd like to start with you here. Um, can you tell us a, a bit from your experience, um, really what role does, does procurement and supply chains play in driving profitability up? Um, and, and so, you know, it's often, is, is profitability a goal that you know, procurement supply chain teams are tasked with, should they be, and what's your perspective on that? So I think 
purchasing or sourcing always has a goal of profitability, but it comes through cost, right? We control the cost piece. It's our role to make sure the costs um, are reduced year over year from a negotiation standpoint with suppliers. We have to go out, we have to do discovery, find new suppliers, new technologies to bring back to the company to help drive out costs or provide more value to the customers. Um, so profitability for us comes through how we manage costs and how we bring technology into the company. Great, thanks. Craig, what's your take on it? With your experience in manufacturing and engineering, is, is, is profitability and cost reduction a target for those teams? And what's sure, your, sure. What's your thought there? Uh, you mentioned we want to make this interactive. Uh, maybe just a quick show of hands. Whose business is in business to make money? Okay, profitability matters. <laughs> <laughs> um, absolutely, profitability matters. I think from my standpoint in my career, I look at it um, simplistically to break it down to be able to, to really get your hands around it. I look at it as almost cost per unit, right? Where in the numerator, cost is going to be mostly material and labor. And from a material standpoint, engineering and procurement manage and improve that in a multitude of different ways, which, which we'll get into today. From a labor standpoint, a majority of that labor is in manufacturing, and so you're trying to optimize manufacturing, you're trying to optimize engineering to, to tackle the numerator. Manufacturing and procurement have a opportunity to also manage the denominator, volume. Right? Now that volume needs to be on time and in full, that's procurement's role, uh, but at the same time, manufacturing can flex up and down on volume to kind of go through cycle, manage recessions, inflation, uh, manage moving volume around the globe, high cost, low cost, new product launches, all these different other variables. And so I think cost per unit's an easy way to start thinking about profitability. And then the hidden piece in all of that is timing, lead time and cycle time. You know, both are absolutely critical, again, dependent upon the business, uh, but lead time and cycle time are critical in order to make that whole equation get to the customer at the right time, right quantity, right place, right quality level, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Great, thanks. And, and John, like, what's your take on this? Like, from your being chief technical officer at Spirit, what were some of the goals that your team was responsible for? And if they weren't maybe directly related to, to cost reduction or profitability, how did they relate? Like, what's your take there? Lots of times in engineering in small and large companies, there's a couple of different metrics. And while cost is one of them, often there are not good cost estimating tools. And so the engineers manage what they know how to manage, which is usually a performance metric, like the weight of an airplane, or, um, or in addition to the schedule, right? Schedule is king. So sometimes cost really gets, should be managed better, but it usually gets a little short shrift from the engineering team. Great. Um, all right, I want to start this next one, uh, Craig, with you. Um, margin goals. You know, we, we all have suppliers, right? And, you know, there's this thought around, uh, you know, how, how open should we be with what margin targets should be? Should these be shared with suppliers uh, between, let's just say, tier one and tier two? As you think about the supply chain, how do you think about that? Should we have shared margin goals? And, and, and what are your thoughts on that? Um, as I mentioned, I'm a recovering consultant, uh, and so I'm going to come at this uh, from a um, couple different angles, right? I think one is absolutely margin goals should be shared and co-owned across the supply chain. Super easy statement to make. The execution of that is really challenging, and the reason the execution of that's extremely challenging is the other angle on this. It is more a cultural issue than it is a financial and data share issue. Uh, so I go back clear to the beginning of my career, uh, for those that may have heard or know the word, uh, keretsu, right? This is the Japanese term of OEMs and suppliers working together and collaborating. Now, they don't necessarily do it from um, a standpoint of love, <laughs> right? But they do it from a standpoint of necessity where they're innovating together, they're managing costs together, uh, and it even has morphed to the point that suppliers are building entire subsystems, not components, because the subsystem is more valuable. But each one is asking the other for their expertise in functional design, in meeting targets and parameters like weight or performance or whatever it might be, but also cost. And in having that cost conversation, they are sharing margin examples or um, even exact numbers 
to make sure that both sides of that equation are balanced. Because if the supplier survives and thrives, the OEM will survive and thrive. And they both know it and realize it. Everything I just described is a cultural construct that then has operational and financial metrics inside of it. So absolutely, margins should be shared. Um, it's challenging, uh, and everybody should try to think through how to get there. Uh, but it is the right destination to strive for, my opinion. Great. Ramel, any, any comments there? More heard kind of from the manufacturing, engineering uh, perspective. From a procurement perspective, you're dealing with them day to day, to day right? Like, what, what's your take on this? Well, I think it's, there is a cultural issue in how you would get there, but I also think there's an understanding of what the value add is and what each party brings, right? Because it's very different if you're doing something that's technology driven versus making a screw, right? You can't, you can't expect to have equality of margins depending on what your val value add is. And I think that's where people will have a cultural difference and struggle because th if you read a public company's statements and you say, well, their margin's 20%, therefore my margin is 20%, it doesn't work. <laughs> Am I allowed to rebuttal? Absolutely. <laughs> uh, I don't think equality of margin, it's transparency of margin. Right. And share. And that's why yeah. I think the cultural yeah. piece comes in, because yeah. people will expect equality. Uh, fair. And so that has to be worked through, because a commodity might be 5% margin, not a 20% margin, whatever it might be. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. John, any take here? I, I, would, I would just add two things. One, it's important to talk about the individual cost of capital. And a lot of people don't think of that. But lots, of, many smaller companies have higher cost of capital than a big company, just because there's more risk, right? It's the same as, as, as a risk level for an individual. And then the, the second thing I would add is that um, trying to, to share margins is, will, will go a lot further if there's a partnership that's, that says, let us talk about how to make this thing and where can we shave costs together and then share in that together. And that's really tough. You know, a lot of that together stuff doesn't happen, but that's the, that's the way to make this successful. Great. So I want to tie in a little bit um, from the, the presentation Peter Zihan this morning. We heard, uh, I'm, my mom's still thinking about some of the stats that were shown on there. But one was about inflation. We've all seen how inflation's you know, been going and, 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 and seen this, right? So I want to actually ask this, this one, Ramel, to you. During inflationary times, what are some things that you do to kind of offset that, working with uh, suppliers? Like, there's only so much you can do, it seems like, but what, what are some things that maybe strategically you've done to help offset that, combat some of the inflationary uh, rises that we've been seeing? So usually, the inflation usually comes around raw materials or maybe labor costs. So it goes to working with the suppliers to understand what can we do to manage those costs? Is there opportunity to go to other, other materials maybe that have a lower cost? or different ways to look at the design to improve it so we're not using as much of whatever is driving the inflation. And I would say the other thing is, is when you negotiate and you have to concede inflation to your suppliers, you need to put the tools in place to manage that over time so you get the claw back when the, when the material starts to deflate or what was driving, driving the cost is starting to deflate. If you don't have that discussion in the beginning, it's very hard to come back two years later and say, well, we gave you a price increase, and now we want that money back because they've already, they've already taken it. Their, their, their business is running off of that price. Mm -hmm. It's very hard to get back without those tools in place when you actually concede and make a, a, a decision to accept whatever the inflationary terms are. John, any, any comments? I, I would agree with Ramel. I, I would just say that, again, an open discussion, depending on the length of the contract. If it's one-year contract, it's not that much risk. Mm -hmm. The buyer or the, the, the person receiving the things might want a longer contract to try and lock in their pricing. But then you just have to have a, a clear discussion of, OK, how much of this new price is going to be based on some inflation? Um, my material costs will go up. My labor costs will go up. I, I would say that most older contracts, especially long-term ones, when we were in the, the zone of no inflation that, that Peter was talking about this morning, you know, a lot of them don't have inflation um, accounted for at all unless it's some hyperinflation. And that makes it very difficult on smaller suppliers in, in these kind of markets we're talking about if you're stuck with a contract like that. Got it. Craig? You covered it well? Ramel and John are the experts. All right, got it. <laughs> 
This next one, though, is for you, Craig. So I can't say no here. Um, uh, so let, I want to talk about your transition. Um, when you made the transition kind of uh, from McKinsey in consulting uh, to now at PTC, like how has your view on, on companies' challenges with tackling profitability, meeting cost targets changed? Um, maybe even thinking about industry uh, specifics. Like what have you seen kind of as you made that transition to now being at PTC? Sure, sure. Uh, so as a consultant, uh, in particular McKinsey, McKinsey's not um, inexpensive. I always worked on what was a top three company agenda item, right? If it didn't have uh, something that looked like $100 million associated with the impact or greater, we weren't involved, right? Um, that's fun. That's, you know, daunting as well at times, but it's fun because you know whatever it is that you're working on is a top three agenda item, and when completed, it will absolutely make a difference for the company. It will truly be transformative. At the same time, as a consultant, you see the beginning of those projects, but you never see the middle or end of those projects because you're expensive. And so you're there, you get it solved, you get it underway, you get the boundaries put around it, and then the organization takes off with it, as it should. Right? There was a, a saying that, that I adopted, you can have something done to you, done for you, or done through you. Two and four are failure modes, right? So it has to be through an organization, and, and I enjoyed that as a consultant to be able to, to set it up. It's a top agenda item, uh, and it's being done through the company. I also think um, there are a thousand medium-sized items that happen that are as big or bigger than those one, two, or three items that I was always involved in as a consultant. And for me, that's the large shift. The day-to-day -day is as critical as the large, or it needs to be, right? And I, I don't know that all organizations think about rolling that up and saying, do we have a portfolio that's as big as our top three, and are these in balance so that we're always working on the highest priority items, the most critical items that are really gonna truly transform a company? Or is it just the flavor of the month, the fire of the moment? Uh, and, and I don't want that uh, for anyone. So I think certainly size and, and frequency is something uh, that's radically different for me. The other piece I would say is timing. Right? When I was involved in large projects, it would be measured in months, always. <laughs> Organizations operate in months, but also years, right? That, that portfolio of many more items, that may take one year, two year, three years to execute. Or the top agenda item may take one, two, three years just to um, permeate the organization and, and truly come to fruition. And so I think there's a timing issue that's also radically different in industry uh, versus consulting, in addition to kind of the size and frequency of, of activity. You say you worked on top initiatives. Um, was cost management, cost reduction usually up there? And if it wasn't, like how, how, are, how are the, uh, you know, let's say at the C level, deciding when this makes sense or not to be a top initiative? Sure, sure. So I'll, uh, I'll touch on the previous question and tie it into this one. Um, as a consultant, I was always thinking through cycle, right? Whatever we do needs to be recession proof and inflation proof. We're thinking through cycle. The recession will last a period of time, the inflation will last a period of time, does not matter. How do we build something that's flexible enough to adapt in those environments, but also how do we take cost out so we have the degrees of freedom to manage those environments? Right. So for example, uh, John and I were sharing uh, war stories around uh, um, the 787 aircraft. I happened to be involved in that program, uh, was there and worked with a bunch of large suppliers. Uh, it was a little bit longer than a year that we were there. In the course of that, they, at the beginning, they were making seven planes a month. At the end of that, they were making 14 planes a month. That's a lot of freedom. They were doing it in two different locations. So one location was doing three and three, three and a half, three and a half for the seven. Now they're doing seven and seven. If something were to happen, you could shut down one site and still make seven. You could take both sites and go to one shift and still make seven. So just the degrees of freedom and flexibility that if the market went back to only seven, or if the market is at 14, and, and being able to adjust to that and, and flex to that. At the same time, um, this airplane's a $250 million uh, purchase price, so it's easy to get a lot of zeros on the numbers. We took about $5 billion in cost out, we deferred about $5 billion in CapEx, 
and then if they're sold at 250 million, going from seven to 14 is several billion dollars a month. Um, so just also a lot of degrees of freedom in the cost reduction to achieve the revenue and then flexibility in managing the revenue based on market conditions. Just as an example, that those are the types of solutions uh, I would urge everyone to think about because that makes it recession and inflation proof. Great, thank you. And uh, Rumel, I want to turn it to you. We talked about kind of perspective on, on this topic and as, it, as you maybe make a shift in your career, it changes, right? Like you went from Sensata to GE Appliances, now to Lightning E Motors, um, all very different companies. Like, how has that your perspective on this maybe changed as you've 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 changed in your career? Um, I think you get an appreciation of all of the different uh, pieces that have to work together for manufacturing, and you work for a large company, and a lot of times you're working with larger companies, and they're sophisticated. They have tools like a priori, or they have other tools that they use. Um, and you have a similar framework for business. And as you change and like go to smaller companies, and the company I'm with now is very much a startup. It's been around for a while, but we're working with a lot of companies where it's their first product launch, or we're working in developing items with companies that are similar size. And you just appreciate and sometimes like not having the structure of a large company mm -hmm. and being able to take risks and to be a little bit more free with innovation because you don't have that bureaucracy and you also want to go really fast. Your, your cycle time is a lot faster to what you want to do as far as introducing new products. So it's sometimes I really miss having the structure because you want people to like follow certain guidelines and make sure that we're making the right financial decisions. But on the other hand, there's a lot of it's nice to have a lot of freedom to go out and take more risks and um, you know, develop new technologies. And it's not the end of the world if they don't work. You move on and you try something else. It's, it's a little bit, it's very different between the companies. Now, John, um, I know you spent a lot of your career at Spirit Aerosystems, um, but now as you've kind of transitioned more to consulting, advising, mm -hmm. have you seen any big, big differences from what you're seeing even recently in, 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 as you engage with clients and Think, how they think about profitability, what their challenges are. Uh, so one, one of the challenges we haven't addressed is a, a company's ability to spend money on improving themselves, but literally including paying for the a priori software when you're in the middle of inflationary pressures, cost push, you know, that sometimes this stuff gets shoved off to the side. And, and, it's, and it's really important to engage the leaders of whatever those decision-making bodies are whether it's IT, supply chain, engineering, and eventually the C-suite, because you're making an investment in the future and you expect to get paid back, right? I spend X dollars on this chunk of software. I spend Y dollars on consultants to help train me and, and get me and my team really good at it. And then uh, uh, there's gotta be a payoff. And, and being able to articulate that as we saw this morning, um, I was unfamiliar with the video that was gonna show the companies, and I can't remember any specifics, but you know, we, we save 70% on such and such, and 62% on this. Th those, are, those are really key for, for leaders that are here to be able to articulate back home, and not only continue what they're doing with, with a company like A Priori, but, but to actually subscribe to more. That, because the power in this thing is way in the deep parts like AP Generate, et cetera. That, that's what I think is really key. Great, thank you. Now, I want to shift gears a little bit. Um, we heard this morning from Stephanie's presentation about digital transformation. Now, this is definitely a buzzword. We've, we all hear the term digital transformation. But I'd like to ask um, Craig here, you know, start off. What do you, how do you define digital transformation? And, and how do we put this in perspective? You know, your title is Executive Vice President of Digital Transformation Solutions. And, and if you could, please give any, a concrete example maybe for the audience of how, how do these large-scale digital transformation solutions and projects help tie in to meeting cost reduction goals, profitability, and margin? Sure, sure, absolutely. So um, this is a classic. You can ask 10 people for the definition. You'll get 11 answers. So I'm, I'm going to add my 11th answer uh, to what digital transformation is. For me, obviously, there's a component of run the business. I will always go back to run the business. Right, the native language of business is the P&L. Uh, it has been for a thousand years, it will be for a thousand more. So I always wanna know what are the financial implications of what we're trying to accomplish. Now that could be cost, that could also be revenue, that could be margin, that could be lots of things. But you know, cost tends to weigh in uh, uh, a lot of the time. So how do you run the business? How does digital 
help you to run the business better, faster, whatever superlative you want to enter in, right? That means data share, single sources of truth, things that we've been hearing about all morning and will likely hear about for the rest of the day and tomorrow. And so there's a data component that's reinforcing how do you run the business. You also heard me mention a moment ago, um, without people, nothing gets accomplished. Um, it's also the largest challenge for probably any and all of us, right? And so there is always going to be a cultural component. Do I believe in the way that we're doing it? Can I embrace a new way of doing it? Um, it these types of elements, right? Again, there's a saying that I, I've adopted over the years, when the pain of change is less than the pain of staying the same, change happens. But it's always painful. It's just less painful. Right? So I think there's a component in there that says, okay, culturally, what is a less painful way of leveraging data and digital to run our business bigger, better, faster? Right? And that, to me, is the definition of digital transformation. The challenges in that, single silos and functions have data, but they're also missing data. They want to share that data. Two people may be measuring the same thing differently. I'll simplify it. One person says it's not hot enough, the other person says it's too cold. That looks like two independent data points, but it's really the same data point, right? And so then you're trying to standardize definitions, you're trying to standardize data systems, you're trying to fill out data systems that are incomplete, and then share and stack hands, and then share goals, share incentives, rewards, recognition, all these, which then brings it back over into a cultural change aspect of getting it right. And so there are a lot of challenges in there, but I think it's about bringing all the pieces together where one plus one truly equals three. Um, an example of that, when I was at McKinsey, I worked with Volkswagen. We were working on the Passat uh, global product, global platform. Um, I wanna say maybe the, the highest volume uh, vehicle for, uh, for Volkswagen. At this time, I think maybe uh, the old Beetle was, uh, was high volume too, but regardless, <laughs> Passat. <clears throat> um, Passat. From an engineering standpoint, we were working on the side mirror. Everybody will leave this room and go and look at the side mirror now because the side mirror on a Passat mounts into the door. Most side mirrors on cars mount into the triangle that's right at the A pillar, right at the base of the door. Why in the world would you mount it into the door? Well, because Volkswagen and most of the Volkswagen Group's side mirrors has an aluminum bracket inside the arm of the mirror. They are likely the only manufacturer in the world that has an aluminum brace inside the side mirror. As a consumer, you don't care. <laughs> That's added cost. Why does it have an aluminum bracket? Because a standard for that company who happens to be in Germany is that it can not have any vibration while going 200 kilometers an hour on the Autobahn. Who drives for Passat at 200 kilometers an hour except Folks that are in, well, maybe a lot of people do, but legally, Germany can. So, you know, you have all these questionings of specifications to then go in and say, is that a justifiable cost? And if so, we need to take the cost out somewhere else, or we need to eliminate this bracket. If we eliminate this bracket, we may have to change the character and change the mounting point on the vehicle, right? So you have all of this engineering that you're thinking about that relates back to cost and, and uh, the ability to uh, compete in the market. It happens to be mounted to the door, the door aligns with the fender, the fender aligns with the hood, and the fender and the hood align with the front headlight. The door has to be more reinforced to hold that mirror. So the door is pretty fixed, and when it's mounted to the car, it's mounted on datums that are master datums, they don't move. The fender is not bolted to the car on master datums. There are a few places where it's bolted that's not a master datum, and those holes can float. So the fender gets bolted on, it's correct to the door, but it's off to the hood. The hood gets mounted and it can only go on one way, you can adjust it a little bit, so now the gap between hood and fender can vary car to car. If that gap can vary, the headlight gap is absolutely going to vary. So now you have a massive rework problem based on the engineering design, part of the contributing factor being the design of the mirror and how it mounts to the door, and therefore the door doesn't have any flexibility. As a result, they had a rework problem. We had to go back in and think about it from a manufacturing standpoint and labor and rework, creating a jig, not even a primary tool, that operators could use that would mimic the other two parts. So when you mount the fender, this jig 
acted as a artificial hood and artificial headlight. Then when you mount the hood, you have something that's mounted on the fender that's measuring the gap to the hood, but also acting like an artificial headlight so that when you put the headlight in, everything's just perfect and it rolls right off the line and you have zero rework problems. Now, I just described a lot of different items that are both engineering and manufacturing that all relate back to a decision based on where a company was located and how it grew up and what local driving conditions were like. It is exactly that complicated in the real world. Right, and so engineering's having to solve a problem, manufacturing having to solve a problem, but what I just described was that is a cross-functional problem where you have a factory in Mexico that has to think about a new jig and fixture, but you have engineering design that's controlled in Wolfsburg, Germany, that's having to change, and everybody has to understand everybody else's problem, which takes a willingness to listen and a willingness to understand the problem, but also raise it above yourselves and say, this is a company problem on the highest volume vehicle in the world and what are our degrees of freedom and if we can take that bracket out we could save five dollars ten dollars per vehicle on 10 million vehicles globally that's a healthy number right so again just the, the thinking about the problem in that way I think is extremely helpful and as has been mentioned procurement plays a role engineering plays a role IT plays a role you know a priori from a data standpoint to be even have the transparency to say here are the different degrees of freedom and trade-offs that I can make uh, to bring all that together. And so then that to me is a, an example of true digital transformation at work, even though half of that transformation was physical, it wouldn't have been possible without digital. Great, I'm never gonna look at my uh, golf's uh, side view mirror the same. I, I can give you all kinds of examples of weird things. <laughs> um, but on that topic, digital transformation, now Ramel, you've brought Opry in to a few different companies, Sensata and Ben Instrumental at GE Appliance. What was the driving factor there? Uh, you weren't sitting back, I'm saying, like, I need to digitally transform. Like, what, was, what were you thinking there? Like, did you think about this, like, like, like the process there? And just give, kind of give a little background of that, that decision process, that you needed to make a change. Well, I think in both cases, the desire for having a robust should cost estimating group was there. So the, culturally, the companies were ready for it. But when you look at the traditional way of cost estimating, where someone, you have an engineer, he has models for how a stamping shop is run. And there are maybe some really sophisticated Excel models, and there's some other software out there that will give you a rough idea about the volumes of the parts and how much it may cost. Um, but you have to look at it either, you have to have a large group with a very specific skill set that can cost estimate multiple parts, or you can look for a solution that helps you standardize work um, for how you do your estimates and has more capability than trying to hire a specific engineer for every type of product you're going to make to, to estimate. So when we looked at a priori, I think in both cases, it was a very obvious choice because it, it took away a lot of the, I have to read this CAD, I have to read this drawing, I have to understand what's critical to the print. It, it drove that very quickly versus having an individual do it and then let whoever that estimator is focus on where he thought the, or she thought the opportunities were um, and looking at the parts and understanding them in a much quicker time frame. Um, so for me, it was a lot about speed and not having to necessarily build an organization with looking for the perfect skill set depending on what products we were wanting to, to estimate. It allowed us to start off with the platform and go, go quite fast. Great, um, I wanna transition, tie in a little bit. John, I'm gonna direct this at you. Um, kind of like your take here on like, what do you see as some of the most important levers uh, companies can take to cut costs and improve efficiency from a design engineering perspective? When we kind of had a conversation, you said you led some global initiatives that were focused on improving profitability. Um, I'd like you to maybe expand on that. What was that project? How did you think about that? How did it help design engineering teams, product teams Im improve profitability, reduce costs? Um, usually th there's, there's two things that have to happen. One is Craig's very articulately expressed his question requirements. So the rear view mirror business is, those were requirements that were set in stone and nobody, nobody went to Germany to push on the people who said, well, we've done this since 1912, so that's what we should do. And th those things happen in big companies. Um, if you don't question requirements, there's too much stuff fixed to change the cost. Uh, the second is we tend not to give design teams time to do cost improvements or cost design until it's over. You know, there's always, so the project I was talking about, you know, we had built at least the first seven airplanes, then we engaged some outside people with expertise in 
detail cost management, cost part, part costing, sorry, and, um, and, and had them engage with our engineers because our engineers didn't really have the, enough of the tools and background. So a couple of things, question, question requirements, get expert help, and, um, and let people focus on that is how I think you can get costs out of products. Great, thank you. Um, Ramel, this one's for you. When we were talking as well, a uh, different side of, of, of the coin here of costs is inventory costs, right? So let's talk about that. How, how do you balance carrying enough inventory, maybe not having too much, um, too much costs? And I know you, you've led some projects to, to work on that. So I'm kind of curious here, what, what are your takes on that? And what are, you know, digitally, digital tools, have you used digital tools to help you in that? Or how do you, how do you balance inventory? I, I think it depends on the situation and the, the company. Um, you know, if you're doing high volume manufacturing, you tend to probably err on the side of having a little bit more inventory um, to make sure that you're protecting because you don't want your plant to go down because you're sending, you know, a hundred, couple hundred people home, right? But like where I'm at today, where it's a very small company and we have a lot of change because we evolve the product quite quickly, like we are on the side of not carrying inventory because I don't want to have a lot of obsolescence. Um, and we, we change, we do an update probably every six months to the vehicles that we make. So I know I'm always going to have that change. So for me, modeling what the supply chain looks like and what the risk is and the different segments of it, if it goes back to raw material, um, if it has like a fast technology curve where you know it's going to be obsolete, being able to model that would be a bigger benefit than trying to have to go through and manually or following like I have 36 week lead time and I automatically order because I have a minimum inventory, right? That's kind of the traditional approach is just minimums and maximums and lead time, right? So now it becomes more, what am I really going to do? What is the cycle life of the part I'm buying or the system that I'm buying? And do I want to carry inventory? How much risk does it have? And um, John mentioned earlier the cost of capital. It becomes very serious when you're a smaller company because mm -hmm. you do have a higher cost of capital and you have suppliers that are smaller and they're working a higher cost of capital. So if you err on the side of making sure you have inventory um, and you don't consume it in a, in a, in a relatively quick way, you, you kind of mess up your entire supply chain because you end up idling your suppliers. Um, and then you're sitting on inventory that's custom to you that you may ha not be able to use again because you needed to make a design change for the market. And, and for us, the market is still new. So we really have to monitor inventory and make sure we're not overbuying and making sure that we understand like the potential changes that are coming. And sometimes it's driven by our customers, sometimes it's driven by legislation, but we have a really fast speed of when we change things over. So not having inventory is a benefit to us. Um, and there's always the risk of you run out of parts, but you have to look at the scale of how much am I going to pay to expedite something versus, um, you know, carry it in inventory and do the total cost of ownership. So I think more focus on the modeling the total cost of ownership is, is very beneficial. Okay, great. Now we, we've got, just to do a time check here, we've got about seven minutes left. We want to have some Q&A as well. So I'm going to do one last question with the panel, and then we're gonna open it up for Q&A. It's kind of, a, we'll do this a lightning round kind of, and I wanna start with, go through the three. Um, so John, with you, um, you know, what's your advice for, for the group here in the year ahead, putting all this in perspective? Um, any advice you'd give the team here, how to think about this, like, you know, some of the challenges we've heard, even tying in the presentation earlier this morning, what advice would you give the team kind of thinking about the outlook ahead and, and kind of this uncertainty in the market and, 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 and such? I, I, would, I would give you the advice to schedule enough time in your day that you're thinking of the future and you're planning on doing something different. If, if you look at a CEO's calendar, it ought to be one third on the future, one third on today's problems, and one third on developing the team. And I'll bet you a quarter, most of them are 95% on today's problems and 5% on developing the team. Um, and, and that, that gets worse as you go down through the, through the levels of management. Um, so what you've done this week is actually thinking about the future, right? You put your old job aside at least until nighttime comes and, and you're trying to learn and, and figure out new, new ways of doing business. So just keep doing that. It's really, it's really key to making a change. Great, Craig? Three quick thoughts. Uh, define where you wanna go, right? In where you wanna go, 
Make sure that it's truly transformative. I love the term double digit impact, right? Double digit percentages, double digit millions. Make sure that where you wanna go is double digit. Cause that'll be truly transformative. In getting there, make sure you have 2,000 people helping you get there, not 20, right? Open it up to the masses, include everyone. Everyone's bringing something. What's their something? Where does it fit and when does it fit? And go through the difficulty of figuring that out because you're gonna get a much richer answer. You're gonna get there better, right? There's a saying, uh, if you wanna go far, go alone. Sorry, yeah, if you wanna go fast, go alone. If you wanna go far, go together. Ramel? Um, I really like that comment because I think it's both of the comments that you made. Um, one, I think people do forget to spend time in developing their team and they just focus on what are we gonna get it done and what are we gonna do today, right? And where's, why is this problem gonna go away? Right, so looking at the long term is really important and making sure you cascade those goals to the team, um, you know, vertically within maybe your organization and then across. And then how do you collaborate with your peers and making sure those goals are shared? And they're interpreted the same way because sometimes they're not always interpreted the same way. Your CEO may say it and everybody leaves the room and has a different view of what that is. So I think it's really important to have that cross collaboration with your peers to make sure you're all you're going the same direction and you have buy-in and you work together to get there. Thank you so much. And we are gonna have a brief you know, Q&A, but how about a round of applause for our panelists here? Thank you. Okay, um, I would like to open it up. Um, we've got a wealth of knowledge here uh, between our panelists and would love an opportunity for you to ask questions as well. Um, so we, we do have about five minutes. Um, I think Olivia, you've got a mic here. Um, so would love to just go around. You can raise your hand if you have a question you'd like to ask. All right. So back to the topic of inflation, how do you go back to the supply chain and, and how do you structure the conversation other than hey, I gave you price increases the last two years, I want it back now. <laughs> what, what, what do you suggest that we do? Well, I think one, you have to look at the historical relationship with the supplier, right? And what you've bought over time and what their goals are uh, for the future and how you're aligned, right? It's not having a discussion with the supplier isn't about the data point of give me, give me cost, give me money back, right? It, it's making sure you're aligned from an overall goal perspective what do you want to achieve with that supplier over the long term? Are you aligned from a technology perspective? And then go into what are their goals? Is, there, is their goal just to maintain margin? Is their goal to increase market share? And trying to get that alignment overall to where it's not just a point of uh, you owe me money because I gave you a price increase two years ago, right? If you go in with that, that argument, you're, you're never going to win, <laughs> right? It has to be a relationship discussion. You may win, but you may never like each other again. <laughs> but, <laughs> but you have to go in with the relation, with what's the relationship going to be and how are we going to construct this so it's more, is better for us over time. Um, and, and hopefully there, that drives the discussion of where they can start to return some of the inflation. And it's hard right now, I'm going to say this because of COVID, because there's inflation that you see that's driven by the market but you forget everybody's supply chain was broken. So you don't always see the times where they were air freighting material, where they had their trucks break down on the way to the factory and they didn't get what they were supposed to do and their factory was shut down for a day because they, they didn't have what they're supposed to do. So there's a lot of hidden costs with suppliers that you don't necessarily see because you don't see what happens in their everyday operations. So I think you really have to take a holistic approach because it's really easy to go in with one data point and then go out with, basically the tail between your legs because they just showed you how much money they spent to save, save your business. And you know some of that may be exaggerated, but it started from a place of truth, right? They had as many problems as you did during COVID. So it has to be a holistic discussion. Okay, any other questions? I see some in the back here. We're gonna make you walk, Olivia. <laughs> I think we had two, so we can maybe see a certain event. Let me, let me stand up. <laughs> so hello, everybody. Um, my name is Jean Oliveira. I'm from Brazil, right? Sorry for this broken English. <laughs> so my question is for, for you, Mr. Greg. When, you, when we talk about the margins and profit, right, what do you think if we 
if we get the data from our suppliers, because you know, economy in Brazil is sometimes crazy, but can we have a kind of uh, average of the margins and profit, profit of the oil suppliers and try to work on that list to make our estimations? Sure. Um, I think there are several ways to execute, right? Um, so I don't think there's just one answer. I think the critical piece is, are the companies and the supply chain working as 100 independent nodes, or are they working as one machine? And the sharing of the data creates the opportunity for them to work as one machine. Now, obviously challenges, uh, Ramel and I, I think, are still friends. We'll find out after the panel um, about, you know, it, there's going to be complexity around does margin mean it's the same for all of us, or is there just, you know, what's a... a um, healthy margin based on your business and your offering, and it may not be the same across the, the network. There's gonna be lots of details to work through, but I think it's more about creating one entity that has a vested interest in the entire entity always performing optimally. Most supply chains today are 100 independent, each one solving for themselves and hoping the others make it. And it's just, it's more setting the extreme of the spectrum and trying to move to a better answer that's closer to the end of we're all vested and we're all working to help each other because that's going to benefit ourselves. Okay, thank you, sir. Okay, I think we had one more right here. Actually, I have two questions. Uh, my name is Bruce Alger. I'm with Applied Materials. I've been a customer of uh, A Priori for about six years now. Uh, I'm going to piggyback on his question a little bit. Uh, do you guys do sp supplier specific digital factories or do you do a, just one factory where you put it all together? And then the second question is, do you guys do automation? So are you using PMI or model based definition in your tools and did you have any challenges when you did that? Does anyone want to start? John, do you want to start to take a part of that? Well, so we don't just do um, one model fits all. The, the model at a supplier has to be based on that specific factory. And it's more work, but it's the only way to do it because otherwise you get funky answers. That's part A. I'll give you part B. Yeah, I think it's been different. Um, like I would say when I was at GE, there was a lot of model-based de definition. And where I'm at today, there's a lot of model-based definition. But I think you do have to base it on the factory and what it, the supplier is doing or versus what you're doing because you may have totally different processes. Um, and it may highlight what's more efficient or inefficient if you compare those. Was there any challenges uh, with the model-based definition? Did you guys have to change your strategy as far as CAD design or anything like that? I think the, I think the challenge is that often the suppliers don't necessarily want to give you that much information. Um, it's competitive sensitive. It's uh, IP, yeah, intellectual property. Um, not, not the actual software isn't the issue, it's, it's how, how integrated can you get that, that supplier, especially if you're arguing over margins and what they should be. It's, it's, it's no easy answer there, for sure. The only thing I would add to, to what all has been said, from a model-based standpoint, I think model-based for product is absolutely key, right? I mean, that's how CAD works, that that's, uh, allows you to leverage that data, feed it into PLM, think about configuration management, have multiple products, have reuse, all kinds of wonderful things. So model based on product, absolutely. Model based on factories and processes, yes, to some extent, right? Because the degrees of freedom are so much larger. And if you tried to model a factory to perfection, we'll all be dead and our successors will be taking over the model and then their grandkids might be taking over the model and, and, and what's been accomplished, right? Versus what's enough information to be able to make logical decisions around but not so much information that you're burdened by the model versus making decisions with the data that's coming out of the model. What are, yeah, what are the top four things you wanna know about your supplier's factory, right? Orders out, material in, some midpoint check and orders complete. It's, it's gotta be simple, I agree with you. Thank you for your question. Okay, we might have time for, if there's one more, does anybody else have any questions? I'm hard to see with the light here. Okay. Over time. Well, if you do, you know, we'll all be here tonight during the reception. 
Um, again, round of applause. Thank you so much for being here.